Hello, my name is David Ray Pine and uh, I build custom reproduction furniture and I also do repair work and conservation work on antique furniture. Welcome to my home and my shop. I worked in three different shops before I went out on my own. I started out in Clark County working for a, a small business, uh, building reproduction furniture and uh, doing repair work, refinishing, that sort of thing. Uh, then later I moved to Harrisonburg and got a job uh, there with a larger company that did a, had a line of furniture that they built, uh, again, antique reproduction in style. Um, one of the fellows I worked with in that shop went out on his own and I went to work for him. After a couple years, I became dissatisfied in that position and decided to uh, go out on my own. I would uh, started doing some moonlighting, uh, working evenings and weekends, uh, building furniture for friends and family friends. And uh, that just sort of morphed into the business uh, to where by word of mouth and by way of doing craft shows, people found out about what I do and uh, how I go about it and uh, started ordering furniture from me and it's, it's been a business ever since. That was in 1976. So um, I work with a combination of power tools and hand tools. Uh, Building antique reproduction furniture, of course, the originals that I'm copying were all handmade. And um, so the surfaces that were left by the hand tools become a part of what you see when you uh, examine a, a piece of antique furniture. And I think that's probably true with the reproductions as well. One of the things that I think separates a authentic reproduction from a factory-made reproduction is the fact that uh, surface irregularities left by hand tools are not there on factory furniture. So I use uh, power tools to uh, rough out the stock and, and dimension it and then I use hand tools to remove the machine marks and um, level up surfaces um, and that also imparts that subtle irregularity that you see when you examine a piece of antique furniture. Um, you also see it on a, the surface of a piece of furniture that I've built. Um, over the years, um, my customers have blessed me with orders for mostly high style furniture. So it's come about that I've uh, been able to do a lot of carving, a lot of inlay work, um, building more elaborate pieces of furniture than simple stuff. Um, and so that's sort of the niche that I have uh, worked myself into over the years. Well, let's take a quick tour of the shop. <clears throat> we'll start with the workbench. This is a bench that I built uh, back in, I guess, uh, early 1970s out of uh, salvaged timbers from an old warehouse. You can see I got the vise at the wrong end for most of you guys. I'm left-handed. So the, uh, the leg vise is at the right side of the bench and the planing stop also. Uh, speaking of planes, here's my little smoothing plane I mentioned uh, earlier talking about getting rid of machine marks. This is a 50-degree angled smoothing plane that I made out of a... Uh, scrap block of mahogany. I knew the mahogany would be too soft to hold up to the wear, so I laminated a sole of ebony on it. This is the uh, second blade I've gone through in the, uh, in the plane. So it, uh, it works for me. It's uh, a little bit broader than uh, maybe most smoothers, uh, and that's because the first blade, I built the plane around the first blade that went in it and it was uh, it was an antique plane iron that uh, that was two and a quarter inches wide so I made the plane to accommodate the plane iron. Um, 
So this is what I use to get rid of planer and joiner marks. Uh, got an assortment of carving chisels here that I've accumulated over the years. Uh, don't use most of them. Uh, they, uh, some of them I acquired as groups of chisels at auction sales or estate sales. Um, some I bought because I needed this or that particular shape. So I've got a, a, uh, a big variety of tools, not all of which I use all of the time. Here's no. Here's one of the first tools I ever I ever bought. I, got, I bought this gouge. It's a Buck Brothers, although it's not marked as such. The marking was on the end of the handle, which I cut off. It was about that long originally. Didn't fit my hand. Uh, but uh, that's, I guess, one of the first carving chisels I ever bought. I bought that in 1971, back in the day. <clears throat> So the bench is where a lot of the handwork takes place. Uh, so I've got most of my hand tools right close by. Uh, chisels arranged in size from eighth inch on up to, I guess, two inches. Uh, I've got some uh, end candle gouges, uh, scraper burnishers, and mortising chisels. Going back here, I've got uh, an antique workbench, a right-handed one, so I don't I don't have it set up to use as a bench. It's just uh, more or less my sharpening station, I guess you would say. That bench I dug out of my uh, in-laws' storage building beside their house. It actually was my wife's grandfather's workbench. He was a house carpenter by trade, and it's a it's a pretty pretty nice traditional carpenter's bench. You can see the leg vice is at an angle so that you could clamp a house door on edge or a piece of wainscot paneling on edge in the vice without the bottom part of the vice or the screw interfering with the clamping action if you had something very tall or very wide that you wanted to clamp in it. <clears throat> Coming on around we've got uh, just the, the usual assortment of stationary tools, uh, jigsaws, sanders, shaper. Um, here's a, a vacuum bag I was just using to, uh, to make up some homemade curved plywood for a chair project that I'm working on. Here's a, a repair project that, uh, that just came in yesterday tripod table and the it's got a loose leg all the legs have been broken off and repaired this one's been split got an old repair there and it's loose again so I'll I'll be to tighten that up a nice period piece though <clears throat> here's some panels that I'm gluing up for a uh, a project for a friend of mine that's some of the wildest grain cherry I think you will ever see. I've never seen curly cherry with as tight a curl as that in all my years of woodworking. That's the most highly figured cherry I've ever come across. And that was harvested from a tree growing locally here in the Shenandoah Valley. Uh, coming on around, we've got uh, planer, thickness sander, drill press, joiner. Welcome to my home. We're in the dining room and uh, so we'll just take a little walk around. Here's a little mahogany breakfast table that I built uh, several years ago. Drop leaf and it's got a swinging leg that folds out to support the leaf when it's up. <clears throat> Pretty common article of furniture in the 18th century. They, they liked small pieces that were portable and multi-use, multitasking. Moving down here to the corner, it's a corner cabinet that I actually made out of uh, leftover lumber. I, I describe it as my scrap wood cupboard. I had uh, taken a commission for a drop leaf table 
and ended up after the project with a lot of uh, narrow and highly figured wood pieces that weren't appropriate to go into a, a table, so I utilized them in a, making a corner cabinet. And around uh, the dining table you can see I've got an assortment of chairs here rather than a set that came about. Uh, I do a lot of chair work and it occurred to me that uh, if you're building a set of eight chairs it only takes an eighth longer to cut out a ninth one. And so over the years I've accumulated uh, an assortment of uh, side chairs. <clears throat> You can see some carving in the back uh, here. The that's called a Prince of Wales feather. And then we've got some drapery and festoons, a scallop shell. The interesting thing about the uh, Queen Anne style chair is is not just the shape of the back, but if you look at the at the void or the opening you can see uh, another shape. So this is kind of a parrot. You see his little beak here. This is a Philadelphia style chair that would have been called uh, in the 18th century in the Quaker taste. You can see there's a place for a carved shell like the uh, Rhode Island chair has on it, but there's no shell there. That would have been ostentatious. Instead, they relied upon the figure of the wood to uh, provide all the embellishment that, uh, that the eye needs when you look at it. Here's a side chair that I copied for a museum in North Carolina. This is an exact reproduction of a chair that was uh, once owned by James Madison. The original was built uh, near Fredericksburg in Virginia. And there are a number of chairs uh, still in existence with this style back with either three or four slots and the heart-shaped cutout, uh, probably all originating from that Fredericksburg area. And last is a hanging corner cabinet that I made to uh, store my wife's uh, collection of spode Christmas china. She had accumulated enough of it that we felt we needed a corner cabinet to store it in. Thanks for coming by to see my house and shop, and thanks to Wooden Shop for bringing it all here. If you're interested in learning traditional woodworking with hand tools, visit my website at woodandshop.com where you can find free video tutorials, buying guides, and reviews. Make sure you subscribe to my regular blog posts, and also check out my 10 steps for getting started. Enjoy!